This image is of a painting that was done by Art Newton in the middle of the last century, about the time that today's presentation took place. So I decided to use it as a cover image um, to kind of give you a, an atmosphere, an idea of what Southport looked like at the time. And also because we're going to be celebrating Art Newton's life and work later this month. And I'll tell you more about that at the end of the program. So this is uh, this, the waterfront that is a shrimp house to the right. And that's Dan Harrelson, Tommy Harrelson's dad's grocery store there in the main picture. So this is an image you might have seen in the state port pilot. Um, it, it was in the July 6th edition. This is a homemade refugee boat that washed ashore on Caswell Beach in Oak Island. So you can see from the picture um, that the sides of it are made of styrofoam and the front is made of pieces of sheet metal. And the, the engine is a converted tractor motor that that's what's powering the boat. And those kind of yellowish containers there, those are big containers of gasoline. So the boat washed ashore without any occupants in it we don't know what happened to them, um, but of course we hope that they are safe. Um, but the boat really speaks to the desperation that they must have felt to go out in the open ocean in this vessel. So the arrival of the boat uh, led me to want to share the story of some refugees that arrived in Southport in 1948. So I wrote a, a column for the state port pilot and afterwards I got questions wanting to know more of the story and what happened to the Estonians after they left Southport. So I decided to put together this presentation. And I just wanna mention, I was so delighted because several Southport Historical Society members reached out to me with additional research and information that they had gathered and I've used it in this presentation and it's really um, made it a better presentation. So I wanna thank them for that. And I'm hoping we'll also get to hear a few words from some people at the end of the presentation. So um, we're gonna be talking about a single boat of Estonian refugees, but I wanna be clear that the boat that ended up in South Southport is not the only boat of refugees that came from Estonia um, during that period. There were multiple boats and the newspapers kind of nicknamed them the Viking boat people. And they embraced that, um, that nickname. It was, it was given to them because of their heritage and they, they took it as a matter of pride and so they embraced it more proudly. And you can see uh, on the left there is a, sort of an, a, a typical Viking boat that they used um, to um, during the time, during the, uh, during the 40s, and then the one on the right is a rendering of an actual Viking ship. So I wanted to give you an idea of what Southport looked like in the post-World War II era. This is an aerial shot. You can see that it was not as built up as today. Southport was more isolated. There weren't as uh, communities around it that there are today. Um, there aren't as many, the, the Bay Street doesn't go all the way through to the Yacht Basin. There weren't as many houses. There were more trees. Um, and the, the roads were not um, paved and the, um, they weren't all paved, maybe some of them were. And the, um, there you can see the docks along the, the waterfront and the shrimp houses. It was very much a, a working fishing village and a working waterfront. This is a ground level view of the waterfront. Um, so the building on the right is Dan Harrelson's grocery store, the one that was in the painting at the front, on the front page. Um, and then this is just gives you an idea of what the waterfront looked like at that time part of it. And this is a picture of the intersection of Howe and Moore Street. So it's looking down Moore Street and the, the young man that's crossing the street is crossing um, Howe Street. If anyone recognizes that boy, um, I'd be interested in knowing who he is. And then just sort of as a, a uh, to clarify, to give you, to orient you, um, my understanding, these pictures are of the same place. And my understanding is that where that gazebo and that flag are on the right that we're used to seeing, if you look on the left side picture, there's a Coca-Cola sign on the left side of that building, that that's about the same place that that was. So that kind of gives you an idea of how it looked then and how it looks now. And here are two images of uh, the intersection at Howard Moore. So as you can see, um, some of the buildings have changed. And I think to me, the biggest difference is the, the trees that used to be right on the edge of the street um, are no longer there. 
I couldn't find a picture of the class of 1948, the year that we're talking about, but this is uh, the class of 1945. Um, so I'm thinking they were a similar size. As you can see, there were 13 students in this graduating class. So again, it gives you an idea of the size of um, Southport at that time. So this gentleman is Captain Hewlin Watts. Now he is um, the great grandfather of one of our board members, Mary Ellen Watts Poole. And he was about 45 or 46 when this photo was taken. It was about uh, four years after the war ended. He was a uh, military veteran. Um, he and his son Basil both served in the military during World War II. He was just about 40 um, when he served uh, in the Navy and his son was about 18 when he served in the Coast Guard. Um, then after the war, he started the first charter fishing business. So they didn't call it um, charter fishing back then, they called it a party boat business because they would take a fishing party out on a boat and act as a fishing guide. So Captain Watts was a, a really good uh, fishing guide. Here is, he is with um, a single day's catch, that's him right there, uh, that was caught on one of his fishing excursions. This photo was taken uh, a few years later in um, the early 1950s. So that's, that's him there, and then that's his son right there, standing up on the left. Um, but as impressive as this day was, this catch is, it's nothing compared to what they encountered on August 11th, 1948. This is Captain Watts' first party boat, the Eidolon. Uh, so he would eventually go on to have three more charter boats and um, a shrimp boat and maybe more, I'm not sure, but this was the one he was out on that day. He was taking a party of men out fishing and they, had, they were uh, around the frying pan light ship when they spotted an unfamiliar vessel. It was a single masted sloop, but it was designed differently than most of the, the boats uh, around here. The helm was in the back rather than the front. And as he got closer, he saw the boat, which was only 37 feet long. So it was smaller than his own boat. It was loaded with 15 people. And when he got within hailing distance of the boat, he was very surprised to hear the captain call out, where is Wilmington? Now the boat was flying an unfamiliar flag too. It was the Estonian flag, but Estonia was no longer considered a separate country. So I wanna take a moment to talk about the Estonian flag because we all know that Americans love our flag and we display it often. Well, the Estonians are also very proud of their flag. And as you can see, it has three stripes. They're blue, black, and white, and they stand for sky, earth, and snow. This is a photo of an Estonian landscape side by side with the flag, and you can start to see how the design came about. And here's another image that shows it even more clearly. In the insert, you can see the um, Estonian sky, the tree line, and a field of snow looking very much like its flag. But of course, the stripes don't just stand for sky, earth, and snow, which is a beautiful enough imagery. Um, the blue also stands for faith, the black for the suffering the country has endured, and the white for the hopefulness and striving for the future. And I really think those three themes um, are really part of the, the Estonian refugee stories that you'll hear today. So sometimes people are not really sure where Estonia is, so I wanted to show you on this map. This map um, shows the areas that the Soviet Union uh, was absorbing into its territory during those years, including Estonia, which is right up here uh, next to Russia and across from uh, Finland and Sweden. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be able to explain everything that was going on in Estonia in those years. Um, and I'm, I'll give you a, a couple of resources at the end of the program. But I do wanna explain that the Estonian Republic was its own independent country for a little over 20 years in the early part of the last century. Then in 1940, it was invaded by the Soviets. And then in 1941 by Nazi Germany. And finally by the Soviets again in 1944. It wasn't until 1991 that it once more achieved independence. So in 1948, when the refugees arrived in the Lower Cape Fear, it was illegal for anyone to raise the Estonian blue, black, and white flag in their country. 
So when the refugees raised their flag that day to, when they saw Captain Watt's boat, it was a small act, but it was a significant one. In effect, the refugees were saying, we might look like we are desperate and homeless, but we are proud of who we are and where we come from. So Captain Watts was probably the perfect person to meet them on their boat that day, because you see in the year or so before he enlisted in World War II, he had worked for the US Navy as a confidential observer. And that meant that when he was out fishing in his boat, he was supposed to keep an eye out for any unusual activity or boats and to report it back to the military. And on the left, you can see the certificate that he was given uh, to thank him for his work as a confidential observer for the military. So uh, Captain Watts knew right away that he needed to notify the Coast Guard of this foreign vessel that was coming in without proper authority. So Captain Watts uh, led the boat, which was called the Roland, past the frying pan shoals and across the bar into the Cape Fear. And then the Coast Guard took over and led the Roland to Battery Island. They had them anchor there overnight. They wouldn't let the travelers leave their boat, but they did give them some food and fresh water. Captain Wortman, who was the only one on the Roland who was fluent in English said, I was very glad to get a drink of cool, fresh water and so were the others. We still had plenty of food left, enough to last us about a week or so. Nobody went hungry on the trip, although we did not waste anything. We had enough tanks to supply us with two tons of water and we still had some left when we landed here, although it did not taste very good. So the next day, the Coast Guard led the Roland the final 22 miles on their journey to the port at Wilmington. There, Mr. Jennings Otts, the customs inspector, boarded the Roland and examined the travelers' papers. They were in a better position than many refugees in that they did have passports and other documentation, even though they didn't have visas. So this is a photo of the Estonians singing their national anthem on the boat. And so when I first saw this photo, it made me uncomfortable because I felt like um, the travelers were being put on the spot. Like, hey, you know, the reporters, like, hey, sing your national anthem for us. Let's get a good photo op. But the more I researched it, I realized that wasn't the case at all. It wasn't a staged event. They weren't being coerced um, because as I, I researched them, I realized how proud they were of their accomplishment and of their country and that they were probably <clears throat> happy to sing their anthem, which like their flag, would have been forbidden to do so in their homeland. And they were also happy to serve as unofficial ambassadors for their country and to encourage the world not to forget about Estonia and their families who were still suffering under Soviet occupation. I also learned that the practice of group singing was a long-standing tradition in Estonian culture and that raising their flag, which you can see right there, uh, and singing together uh, especially singing their forbidden national anthem and their forbidden traditional Estonian folk songs would eventually play a large role in their country's overthrow of Soviet occupation. So in the years 1987 to 1991, Estonians conducted some peaceful demonstrations of large group public singing to raise the world's awareness of their plight. And these demonstrations flummoxed the Soviets because they would have looked bad on the world stage if they responded to these people singing with violence. So obviously there was a lot going on behind the scenes, but the, the front, the, the image, the face of this revolution were these people singing together and raising the awareness. And they were part of this, um, this governmental overthrow that came to be known as the singing revolution. So again, I'll have some more information about that at the end. Um, Captain John Wortman was the skipper of the Roland. He was fluent in English and he gave an interview to Our State Magazine at the time of their landing. It was just known as State Magazine back then, but it, you would know it as Our State. Um, I'm gonna quote from his interview so you, that you can hear him describe the experience in his own words. And one of the first things he said was, um, it was a long trip, but it was worth it. He said, everybody here, meaning people in Southport, people in Wilmington, everybody here seems happy. Look, they're all smiling. In Estonia, nobody smiles anymore. We come from Estonia, which as you know, has been overrun by the Russians. We had not much to eat. And when we got work, there was little pay for it. I own some property, but the Russians took everything I had. I had nothing left. And there were many others like me. 
Conditions became worse and worse and many people were getting desperate. Some of us decided we could not stand it any longer. There were 24 of us who made up our minds to leave Estonia. We got together four little boats, none of which was more than 15 feet in length. Each of them had a sail. And then one night we stole aboard these boats, carrying with us as many of our belongings as we thought we could get aboard. We set sail heading for Sweden where we knew we could find refuge. That was in the summer of 1944. So that happened four years before they came to North Carolina. We had to sail 90 miles to get to Sweden. There was a little storm, but our boats made it all right. And what he glosses over is the fact that those waters were guarded. So they would have had to uh, slip past um, military boats to get there. For four years, we lived in Sweden doing carpentry work, farming and other things like that. But we were beginning to get frightened again. The Russians were appearing in the picture once more. We heard where they had seized some Russians who had fled from Sweden. The Swedish people were nice to us, but they would not resist the Russians. Who knows, it might be our turn next. And we knew the kind of fate that lay in store for us if the Russians should ever get their hands on us again. So again, Wortman is glossing over the details here, possibly because at the time people knew what he was alluding to as far as what the Soviets were doing. Um, but if they were sent back at the very least, they would be sent to work camps in Siberia. And at worst, they would be killed outright. And in fact, um, just seven months after the Roland arrived in Southport on March 25th, 1949, one day, 20,000 Estonians, mostly women and children were rounded up and deported from Estonia. So Captain Wortman was not exaggerating the fate that awaited for them if they were sent back to the Soviets. Wortman said, we had saved a little money. I found where a little boat that could be bought in the city of Gothenburg. It was only 37 feet long. It had one mast with the mainsail and a jib. Also a small engine, but the engine was not much good. When I told the owner that I wanted to sail across the Atlantic Ocean in it, he laughed and said, you are crazy. Some of our countrymen did not want to go. They were afraid of that little boat and they said that all of us would be drowned. But there were 15 of us who were determined to take the chance. We purchased the boat and proceeded to stock it with supplies. We built little cubby holes, which could be used for bunks. They were built in two decker style. It was very crowded and we knew that the long voyage would be unpleasant, but we were not discouraged. And so in this photo, you see Captain Wortman in the center. Um, on, to the left in the picture is his wife, Wilhelmina, and over his shoulder is his daughter, Helgi. On the 23rd of June, we set sail from Gothenburg, Sweden. The others who would not come with us were there at the dock to see us off. There was some crying as the space of the water between us grew ever larger. So they knew no matter what happened, they were never going to see each other again. The trip across the North Sea was very rough at times and almost everybody aboard got seasick, but it did not last long and we were kept cheerful by the knowledge that we were getting further and further away from the Russians all the time. Then we sighted England. We sailed down the coast for some distance and stopped at Dartmouth. The immigration people were very nice to us. They let us tie up at a dock. When we told them where we were from and where we were going, they were surprised, but they said they would help us. We asked about food, but they shook their heads. They said that we wouldn't, they were afraid we would not be able to buy any. However, that did not worry us because we had crammed every vacant spot aboard with potatoes, canned goods, bread, and other food before leaving Sweden. We were allowed to take some additional oil aboard for the engine and also fresh water. In a little while, we were ready to go. So it was not long before we were in the great Atlantic Ocean. Our little boat proved to be very seaworthy. So this picture is of them at the dock in Wilmington, but I'm including it because I like the, the angle. It really kind of shows you the, the size and shape of the boat. He says, as you see, she has plenty of beam in proportion to her length. An old tub, probably you would have called her, but even when the waves got very high, I did not become anxious because I knew that she would carry us through. Sometimes we saw boats far away, but none of them came near us. It took us 11 days to get to the Madeira Islands, and here we stopped again. This time, the officials were not as courteous to us as the English people had been. They refused to let us land, and they also refused to sell us any supplies. At first, they would not even let us take fresh water aboard, but finally they yielded to our pleas and let us have the water. I think they were glad when we set sail again. 
and we came to the real hard part of the trip. It took us 28 days to make it from Madeira to your North Carolina. We used the sail most of the time and we were lucky to have good winds for many days, but it became very tiresome for everybody aboard. We also ran into some storms. When these came, everybody had to get below because the waves would sometimes wash heavily on the decks. Day after day, it was the same. Sometimes our people sang songs, other times they would read, but most of the time they would just sit and talk or else lie down and sleep. We had an accordion with us and this helped to give us good music with our singing. We all got together very nicely among ourselves and it was seldom that a crossword was spoken. I guess that we all felt very close to one another because we were sharing the same risks and the same dangers. So um, that's all from um, his interview with the state, but um, Southport author Lou Hardy wrote about the moment when the Roland reached the Lower Cape Fear. And I really like his description. So I'm gonna switch to that and read that to you. So he said, Lou Hardy describes it as he says, um, 49 days after departing Gothenburg, those aboard stood on deck and saw the twin masts of a light ship come into view with the bold faced words frying pan blazing white on its bright red steel hull. Puttering about nearby was the sleek laid back Eidolon, its little engines sputtering and spitting spray from its stern, its propellers churning up white foam on the clear blue green of the Atlantic. Overhead seagulls screeched, impatient to be thrown scraps of fish. We can only imagine the joy, relief, and anxiety the Estonians must have felt. But overriding all, they knew they were in America. Freedom was at hand. So Captain Wortman described that moment like this. And then came the happy day that one of our men shouted that he saw land. Almost at the same time, we saw a little boat ahead of us. We found out later that it was a fishing boat. It came alongside and we talked to each other. I said, we wanted to go to Wilmington. And the captain of the boat said he would show us the way to Southport, which he did. We stayed there during the night and the next day the Coast Guard boat led us up the Cape Fear River to Wilmington. So um, Whitman finishes up, wraps up his um, interview with the reporter and he says, look at this little red head here. She's my daughter, Helgi. She is 16 years old. And see that lady standing over there? She is expecting a baby. It will come in about two months. So one of the passengers on the Roland was someone who was maybe five to seven months pregnant the whole time. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to find out uh, her story, but I would really like to know um, more about it. Okay, so Whitman said, all of us are working people and we all we ask for is a chance to work and make a living in this country. What happens next? That I cannot say. We have reached the country that we had hoped and prayed we would get to safely. I know that we did not come here with the proper permission, but I hope that we will be permitted to stay and become good American citizens. That is all we ask for. So the refugees were cleared at Wilmington's Custom House. They were in better shape than many of the other Estonian refugees who arrived because they did have passports and health papers and documents proving that they had never been in prison. What they didn't have were visas giving them permission to enter the country. Um, this picture, I just have to say, this is not um, of our refugees, our Estonians. This is, uh, I think these are some um, German immigrants, but I just really like the picture, so I included it. Um, so the Estonians were sent to Ellis Island in New York. Um, nowadays, when we think about Ellis Island, we think about its history as the gateway to America where immigrants were processed and then sent on uh, into America to begin their new lives. Um, but following World War II, it was used a little bit differently. It was more of a detention center. Um, there was a lot of concern at the time about communism and immigrants infiltrating the US and disrupting our democratic way of life. So still the average stay at Ellis Island was about a week, um, but some people stayed for weeks, for months or even years. And some were deported back to their home country. At that time, there was this saying among the residents at uh, Ellis Island um, that from Ellis Island, you can see Lady Liberty, but she can't see you. The Roland passengers were fortunate. Lady Liberty did see them and they were released after only four months. And that was in part due to having their papers in order. And also it helped that Harry Truman took a special interest in refugees from Estonian and the Baltic states. 
Down in Southport, a man named Bill Wells also did all that he could to help the refugees as well. So he wasn't allowed to contact them directly on Ellis Island, but he put notices in newspapers and got the word out as much as he could um, that he was willing to pay the bond for the 10 men and offer them jobs in Southport. And those bonds were not a small amount. It was $500 per person. So for 10 men, that's $5,000 or the equivalent of $62,000 in today's currency. Wells said that he was not doing this out of an act of charity. He said that any man who could safely navigate across the Atlantic using only a compass and a sextant and endure storms and hardships like that was a man that he wanted working for him. And I do want to point out the, the, um, the Roland intended to go to Wilmington all along. Captain Wortman, when he, before the war, had been a first mate on um, a boat uh, that had gone to Wilmington a couple times. He'd actually been there before. He knew where the customs house was. So they uh, set out from Sweden intending to go to Wilmington the entire time. Um, by the time word reached the men at Ellis Island, um, the Lutheran church had already paid their bonds. So they were all Lutheran. And so the church had, was trying to help them out. Several of the men had already been released and had found jobs uh, elsewhere, but five of the men were available and interested in coming back to Southport. So Wells sent them and their families bus tickets to return to Southport. They, uh, this was right at Christmas time. And the first thing they did upon reaching Southport was to attend service at Trinity United Methodist Church. So even though the Estonians weren't Methodists, they were welcomed with open arms. Um, like several families in Southport, Bill Wells ran a shrimping business. Shrimp boats um, brought their catch to the shrimp houses that lined the waterfront. So this image is of the Wells Shrimp House and their workers uh, behead the shrimp, which were then uh, put on ice and were shipped to Fulton Fish Market in New York City. Wells had a fleet of shrimp boats and he put the Estonian men to work on them. Um, at first, Wortman worked as first mate on a boat called the Wolf Pack. It was a 54 foot trawler with 100 uh, horsepower diesel engine, uh, ship to shore ra radio, and electric lights. It was much fancier than the Roland had been. Um, before long, John Wortman became skipper of an identical sister ship of the Wolf Pack named the Bill Jr. And then within three years, Captain Wortman had purchased his own shrimp trawler, which he operated himself. The Estonian men were hard workers, and they were willing to go out in all kinds of weather to fish. <clears throat> of course, on some of their fishing excursions, the fish got away um, <clears throat> when they were fishing, fishing for other kinds of fish. But the men still came back and had um, fish tails to, to share at the Whitler's bench. So one time, um, Captain Wortman had been out fishing and he injured his hand that was, he, was, he was bitten by a shark. Um, the next day, he still went out fishing, but he favored his injured hand. So when he caught a fish in his net, he held the net with his good hand. And then to save his bad hand, he attempted to take the fish out of the net with his teeth. This didn't work real well. Uh, the teeth got stuck in the fish and in the confusion, the fish leapt out of the net and got away and took his false teeth with him. So he told the story and said that if anyone caught a fish wearing a pair of dentures to be sure and return them to him. So even though things were going well for the immigrants, they still had a cloud hanging over their heads. They were at risk for being deported back to the Soviet Union. And on top of that, Captain Wortman was sent a bill from the US government to pay for the cost of transportation, housing, and feeding while everyone had been at Ellis Island. Because he was the captain of the ship, they were holding him responsible for everyone. The total came to $12,000 or the equivalent of $150,000 in today's currency. Finally, after several years and a lot of public pressure in 1952, Congress created a special bill specifically for the Estonian and Baltic immigrants who had come here as refugees. Um, and as you can see, the bill specifically listed each and every name of the refugees that it applied to. There were a little over 300. Um, and this bill gave them the opportunity to apply to change their immigrant status. So once this bill passed, they were no longer here illegally. They were legal immigrants who could work towards becoming American citizens. Um, so within a few years, most of the Estonians had decided to move on from Southport. Um, it wasn't a great time for shrimping um, in those years and they went on to other areas. But there was, and there were some small Estonian communities in Florida and Texas and some chose to go there to start their lives in America. Um, one man was named 
August Quieger, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, Quieger. Um, he's in the center of this picture here, and he decided to stay in Brunswick County. So he was in his early 20s when he arrived in Southport. He'd already endured uh, an, an eventful life. He had um, been forced into serving in the German uh, military. And then uh, when the Soviets took back over, he escaped to Sweden. And then he had traveled across the Atlantic in the Roland. So all of that had gone, uh, gone on just in the, in, by his early 20s. And he was really looking to put down some roots. So he became friends with a local fisherman named Franklin Varnum. And Franklin uh, invited August to his home in Supply. And there he introduced August to his cousin, Janya May Varnum. And before long, they were married and had three children together. And they settled in Supply. August was a skilled carpenter and an excellent builder and a commercial fisherman. He was a friend to anyone that knew him and he joined the Gospel Center Baptist Church. So even though August enjoyed his life in America, he couldn't help wondering about the family he had left behind in Estonia. He'd left his parents and his three younger sisters and he didn't know what had become of them. During the Cold War years, he, he couldn't even risk sending a letter back home out of fear that it would endanger them. And so he just wondered and waited. And then in 1991, a miraculous thing happened. Estonia once more achieved independence. August's son-in-law, used the internet to help him locate his family in Estonia. And then in 2004, after 63 years of being away, August traveled back to Estonia. His first wife had passed away in 1997, but his second wife and his two daughters went with him. It was a bittersweet homecoming. His parents had passed away um, without ever knowing what had happened to their only son. His sisters had grown up and lived their own lives under Soviet rule. They had married, had children, and grandchildren of their own. Estonia had changed as well. Very little of it resembled the way that he remembered it. And he discovered that he had some trouble communicating because he had lost much of his native language after so many years. But he was grateful to see his sisters and to reunite with his family. So this is a photo of August with his sisters in Estonia. And hopefully I pronounced their names correctly. Alma, on the left, Alma, and then Naima and Lida. And in 2013, August um, passed away at the age of 89. He left behind his wife, his three children and their families, including 10 grandchildren and 19 great grandchildren. So I wasn't able to contact any of his children before this presentation, um, but if anyone knows them, I would be interested in getting in touch. Um, I did hear that those who knew August said that he was a very good storyteller and that he would often recount the stories of his voyage to America aboard the Roland. So the Wortman family, um, they left Southport in the early 1950s. Helgi and her mother, um, it was a little bit hard for them because Helgi and her mother had been unable to find work in Southport. Uh, John was often out shrimping. And so Helgi and her mother um, spent most of the year up in New Jersey uh, where the Lutheran church had helped them find jobs at a restaurant. So they would come down periodically to visit him. So that was hard on the family. So as soon as he could, John brought the family back together. Um, he moved to Texas uh, where there was a small Estonian community and shrimping was very plentiful. Um, he also might've spent some time in Florida, probably just shrimping there, but he, they might have lived there briefly, or maybe his wife and daughter had followed him when he was down there um, shrimping, because that did happen. Um, so Helgi interested me especially, because she was the only child on board the Roland, and when I looked back at her life, I realized how disruptive and chaotic her early life had been. So um, just to, to give you an idea, so she was nine years old when the Soviets invaded her country, nine. Then when she was 10, the Nazi Germany invaded the country and under 10, from 10 to 12, she lived under Nazi occupation. Then when she was 12 was the second Soviet occupa uh, occupation. And that's when she escaped in the middle of the night on a boat to Sweden with her parents. So from 12 to 16, she lived as a displaced person in Sweden. Then when she was 16, she traveled across the Atlantic on the refugee boat with no idea whether they were gonna make it. She spent her 17th birthday in Ellis Island at a detention center, not knowing whether she was going to be released into America or sent back. 
Um, now, and then when she was 18, she was released and she was traveling between New Jersey and Southport um, working um, and trying to help her family. By the time she was 21, she was married and had had a baby. She became a mother. She lived in Florida, which is what makes me think maybe they spent a little bit of time in Florida um, when they first went down there or maybe when he was shrimping. Um, she married an American man. He had been, his family went back generations in Miami. Um, but unfortunately, and they had one son together, but unfortunately the marriage didn't last. Um, by the time she was 27, she was divorced. She had become a nurse, I'm assuming sometime during her marriage, and she had moved to Texas. So after her divorce, she moved to um, she moved from Texas. Her parents were already living there. She got a job working at St. Paul's Hospital in Texas, and she lived in a dormitory at the hospital with other nurses. So the building there marked F, that's her dormitory, and the buildings ABC, those are um, the hospital. So her son, John, stayed behind in Florida with his father and his father's second wife. So um, her ex-husband remarried almost immediately after the divorce. Helgi would have been a single mother. She was not yet um, a full citizen of the United States. She was working on that. Um, so it's possible that the courts felt that her um, husband could provide a more stable home life and a better standard of living. So I'm sure that was very difficult for her. It appears that her son had a good life in Florida. He was a Boy Scout. He attended the local junior high and the local Baptist church. But unfortunately, when he was just 13 years old, he was killed in a hit and run car accident. He was the only child Helgi ever had and the only grandchild that her parents ever had. About a year after her son's death, Helgi married her second husband, uh, John, Jan Tam. And like her, Tam was an Estonian refugee. Uh, he was a shrimp fisherman like her father. So they had a great deal in common. And it appears that they had a good life together in Texas. And this is the house they lived in, in Brownsville near her parents. So as I mentioned, Helgi's father had moved to Texas even before she did. Um, and it may seem kind of random to move to Texas from Southport, but remember he had become a shrimper when he moved here. And in the early 1950s with the advancement of um, refrigeration techniques and larger boats and stronger nets, shrimping really took off in Brownsville. And in 1953, the city constructed a dedicated shrimp harbor off of the main ship channel at, the, at its port. Um, and of course here in 1954, Hurricane Hazel hit, which might've been um, a, a, a huge um, disaster for his own shrimping boat and shrimping business. There was also a small Estonian community gathering uh, in Brownsville. So it made sense that that was where Captain Wortman and his wife ended up. Um, so by 1955, they were living there and Wortman had become a member of the Texas Shrimpers Association. So uh, Captain Wortman and his wife purchased um, the small house you see on the left. It was a little over 800 square feet. And then um, eventually they purchased the home on the right, which is about twice the size at 1600 square feet. That house was built in 1965. I don't know if they built it or if they purchased it um, later, but those were the houses they lived in uh, in Texas. In the 1960s, John also began amassing his own shrimp boat fleet. So his first four ships were named um, the Neap Tide, the Low Tide, the High Tide, and the Spring Tide. And they were each about 65 feet long. So each one of them was nearly double the size of the Roland that he had taken across the Atlantic 15 years before. And I know this is not a good photo, um, but I wanted to share this article with you um, from the Brownsville Herald, because it shows that Captain Wortman's boat, the Spring Tide, won best decorated shrimp boat in their annual shrimp fiesta. And um, I can kind of see some bunting. I'm assuming that's red, white, and blue bunting and flags flying. And I can't tell what else, maybe flowers or things. Um, and on the back, you can see it says spring tide. So I'm kind of assuming that Mrs. Wortman, maybe Helga, Helgi had something to do with decorating the boat. So over the next few years, Captain Wortman continued to expand his fleet, um, but that you, you can see his naming conventions began to be a little more personal. He changed it a bit. He registered three more boats in 1966. The first one was the Hope, which reminds me of the symbolism in the Estonian flag. The next one was the Helgi, and then the Valley. And I'm assuming that Valley was a nickname for his wife, whose name was Philomena. 
Um, and then in 1967, he named a boat Master John. So as we know, his only grandson died in a hit and run accident at the end of 1966. So it appears that this boat, the next one that he built was named in his grandson's honor. And then the final boat that we have a record of was built in 1969, and it was named the Roland, the same name of the ship that brought him to America. So this is the final image that we have of the Roland. It was taken here in Southport at the Yacht Basin by Art Newton. Um, after they arrived, um, Wortman had tried to sell the boat, but US laws wouldn't allow a foreign ship to be used as a commercial vessel. So that really decreased its usage and its value. So it just sort of hung out near Jim Arnold's dock at the yacht basin. And then in 1954, when Hurricane Hazel hit, uh, the boat was finally destroyed and sank. Recently, a rotted ship hole was uncovered at the waterfront. And there are some of us who are wondering if that could be the remnants of the Roland that was unearthed. Um, even if it isn't, it's possible that the Roland is still resting somewhere along the waterfront waiting to be uncovered. And in 1985, 37 years after he arrived in Southport, John Wortman died in a car accident in Texas. He was 77 years old. His wife, uh, Bilomine, passed away five years later and their daughter, Helgi, died in 2006 at the age of 76. So when I put this presentation together, I really wished I could have said that after they got to America, they all lived happily ever after. But as we learned, they had their share of joys and sorrows. But then I remembered what Captain Wortman said when the Roland first arrived in Southport. He said they just wanted a chance to work and to make a living in this country. So they didn't come here expecting to live happily ever after. They were grateful for the opportunity to provide for their families, to contribute to the new country and to live in peace. As Captain Wortman said, I hope that we will be permitted to stay and become good American citizens. That is all we ask for. And that is what they did. Helgi's second husband, Jan Tam, was the last member of the family to pass away. He died in 2013 at the age of 94. So for about 50 years, all the Estonian refugees who had arrived in North Carolina and Virginia and Florida and along the Eastern Seaboard had held a reunion in Miami to get together annually and reminisce about their unique shared experience. So at one of the last reunions, Tam and one of his friends were asked whether they could make the journey again. And Tam, who was 74 at the time, and he said, no, when you're young, you see things differently. He said though, that when his TV displayed scenes of present day boat people, he and his fellow Viking boat people remembered their own youth. And Tam's friend said that he understands what inspires the Cuban and Haitian refugees. He said, in a dictatorship, things get so bad until you realize you only have one life to live. Finally, you decide to take a chance on the future by throwing yourself upon the sea. So you may have noticed that the pictures in this presentation that were taken in North Carolina were largely photographed by Art Newton and Hugh Morton. So these two men were contemporaries. They were born only a year apart. Morton grew up in Wilmington and Newton grew up in Southport. They both served as military photographers during World War II. And then following the war, they both made their livings taking photographs of the Lower Cape Fear. So we're indebted to both of them for documenting life in coastal North Carolina during the middle of the last century. And in Southport, we're especially um, indebted to Art Newton, who took so many pictures of life in Southport. And in addition to being a photographer, Art Newton was also a fine artist who painted in oil and watercolors. So this is a painting he did of some of Captain Hewland Watt's fishing fleet that was docked at the Southport Yacht Basin. And then in the lower left corner, you can see the photo that, of Captain Watts that uh, was taken by Hugh Morton. So Art Newton passed away in 1964, but this month is the 100th anniversary of his birth. So the Southport Historical Society is doing a centennial celebration in his honor, and you are all invi invited to join us at the Southport Community Building on September 1st at 6.30. Um, it's free, it's open to the public, and we're going to be displaying some of his photos, original artworks, and we're going to have music and cake. And then on September 2nd, um, Art Newton will be the featured artist at the Ricky Evans Gallery at the first Friday Art Walk from 5 to 7 p.m. 
Um, both of those events, September 1st, September 2nd, free, open to public, and we hope you can join us. You don't need to make reservations. In a minute, I want to introduce you to a couple of people who I hope are still um, on the um, in the program and that have some additional information about this. But first, I want to let you know that if you're looking for more information about the voyage of the Roland and the life of August uh, Quieger, who was the man who stayed in supply in Brunswick County and about his trip back to Estonia to find his family, then I recommend this book called Of Home and the River. It was written by Southport native Lou Hardy Jr. Um, he grew up in Southport, his father owned a shipping fleet. And he devotes an entire chapter to this story and he does an excellent job of writing all about it. And of course, all the other chapters in the book also contain very uh, other interesting stories about Southport, as he says, from Civil War to the present. Um, and it's available online at our bookstore, um, the Southport Historical Society Bookstore and also at the Visitor Center. And if anyone wants to know more about the history of Estonia in general, including insight into the singing revolution, then I recommend this short documentary as a place to start. It's found on YouTube and it's called Estonia, the Baltic Tiger. And it's uh, done by a Swedish journalist. Okay, so in a minute I'm gonna turn the screen back around and um, I wanna introduce you to um, Stephen Atkinson of North Carolina Underwater Archaeology Department. He was on at the beginning, I hope you can still there, um, to tell us a little about the remains of the boat uh, found at the waterfront. And then also uh, Southport Historical Society member, Scott Len, who provided uh, information for um, this program and who also has some uh, insight into the Estonian diaspora. So, Stephen, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? I can, and here is the um, photo from the uh, Stateport pilot. Perfect. So uh, are you in this photo? I am, I am holding the uh, other end of the tape reel near uh, the bulkhead there, that's myself. <laughs> okay, great. So what can you tell us? What do you, what do you think? Could it be the Roland or, or is it something else? I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a fair possibility. Um, so the things that are that kind of struck me about the the shipwreck itself, um, one is the the curvature of the frames. Uh, so I basically went into this investigation thinking, well, it's probably a, a derelict fishing boat from the Southport working waterfront. You know, these things happen. Um, ships out, uh, you know, they 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 outlive their use life, and and a lot of the times they just get left. Um, and that's still possible. However, the things that kind of set this one apart, like I said, was the the curve to the frames, uh, which is, uh, you know, different than more of a flat kind of shear and chine that you would get from um, a fishing boat, as well as um, the general construction of it. So the ship itself was fastened together with wooden trunnels, which is generally an older, more traditional shipbuilding method, which suggests an older age as well as um, you could kind of see if you follow the tape reel along the center of the shipwreck, and what we're looking at is kind of like a football shape here. Um, there's a couple features that one is likely to be a mast step, which is what led us to kind of tentatively identify it as a schooner um, or a working vessel, a sailing vessel, uh, as well as more iron concreted things that very well could be the engine bed for the auxiliary engine on the Roland that they talked about. Uh, another feature is the general length overall here. So we uh, we measured about 10 meters, which is in the ballpark of the Roland, but there's also still structure I know that goes under my feet where I'm standing. And when they would measure a ship, they do the length overall usually on deck. So that gives you a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to mapping say the keel or the lower surviving structure uh, when you're looking at a shipwreck. Uh, it also seems to be fairly wide in, in its surviving state, so a bit beamy, as they say, and um, that could also attribute uh, to it being the Roland. Another interesting feature is um, it was ballasted with concrete, which would suggest later. So if it was an older, older built ship getting sold off and they wanted to do something to essentially um, make it last a little bit longer, try and make it a little bit more seaworthy uh, instead of filling the bilge with lead ingots and then letting it kind of get gummed up 
with debris over the years, you just fill the whole thing with concrete and then the water will hypothetically run off to wherever you have a bilge pump. Uh, so that's an interesting feature that kind of suggests a long working life. And then the last feature I wanted to make a note of is the whole planking itself. Uh, so if we were trying to take a look at a skiff or, or an American made work boat, uh, you know, they would have had either iron or bronze fastening, they would have had more slender planks, uh, or even in some cases, they would have been kind of transverse plank, something like uh, at, a, at an angle off of the keel. Now this wreck has very long, wide sweeping planks that go all longitudinal. And uh, I don't know if you're able to bring up the image of the Roland on its side, but uh, it has those types of planks and it probably would have been fastened in a more traditional way as well. So I think it's a high probability. And um, I think a good example, yeah, there we go. So you can make out right where the mast was if you look at the, uh, the center uh, hatchway right in front of that, uh, you can see a broken off mast. And that pretty much lines up to where we've have a potential mass step. Um, so that's interesting. Plus you can kind of note that from stem to stern, the upper deck is a lot longer than where the, uh, the stern goes down into the keel and the stem. So that could give us some wiggle room, um, but also the wider, it's, it's kind of hard to make out, but right on the rudder, if you look underneath the topmost pintle and gudgeon from the rudder, which is the, the hinge that holds it on there, you can kind of make out the width of the planking. And it had some pretty wide planks. And that's, that's what we're seeing on the, on the shipwreck as well. Um, if out of curiosity, if anybody is looking for a modern um, comparative example, the Gerda 3 is a is a Swedish built vessel that looks almost identical to this and it's at Mystic Seaport and uh, I think it has a fairly similar history if I recall correctly um, I mean the hatchways look the same the cabin looks the same the rudder looks the same it's like dead ringer and uh, it has this the similar kind of of wide planking that I'm referring to I don't know if they built it or if they purchased it um, later, but those are the houses. Oh, they were. I think that's okay. I'm going to. In the 1960s, John, John also began amassing his own. Somehow we're getting a recording. Okay. All right, Stephen, I'm sorry. Did you want to finish? Um, that's the gist of it. Um, I think the last comment I can make, maybe based off of your presentation, is you know, if the vessel was derelict and they were never able to sell it off and it was just kind of sitting there, mm -hmm. uh, that, that adds to the narrative that even after the hurricanes, when it was potentially ripped from its moorings and pushed closer up onto shore, uh, the town people would, would salvage usable wrecks and, or usable mm -hmm. vessels and clean up the waterfront. And if that was already derelict, they'd be like, well, who cares? You know, let it, let it be. So, that's uh, that's uh, that's my two cents. It's exciting. It's it's very exciting that it's a possibility. So, um, uh, it could it could be. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Does anybody have questions for Stephen? Okay. <laughs> um, and then Scott Len, are you still on? Let's see if he's yeah. Oh, great. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your um, connection to your, what you know about the Estonian um, community? Yeah, so, so my, I've been kind of an escophile for a while and, and um, back when I was working in the mid 90s, I did quite a number of trips to um, former Soviet republics and one of them was Estonia. I went and spent about two months there and worked at the, at the American embassy there. And just to couple comments based on things that you said that, um, you know, one of the things after having gone to some of the stands and places like that, you know, you got to Estonia and these people were incredibly proud, right? So I was there, you know, just a few years after they had regained their independence and, you know, the flag was flying everywhere. They were proud of their currency. You know, they were Estonia again after, after all those years of being under the Soviet Union. So it was kind of an exciting time to be there. But what really piqued my interest was 
the embassy there was very small. You know, there probably wasn't more than about a dozen staff Americans there with whom I was working. But of that number, I think three or four of them were Estonian Americans and they all had similar stories. They had obviously worked for the State Department and then been assigned there because they spoke Estonian. But they all had some version of this refugee story. In fact, um, one of the things that was really interesting was that the naval attache there, who I you know, got to know pretty well, you know, he commented one day that the deputy chief of mission had been his Cub Scout leader when they were in, when they were in the Estonian Boy Scout troop in New Jersey when he was a kid. And so you mentioned New Jersey, there's um, a large number of Estonian, the lar probably the largest Estonian community in the United States is in Lakewood, New Jersey. And to this day, in fact, just last week or the week before, they had their annual Estonian camp where they continue now, how many years later, it's 70 years later, they still get together and maintain their cultural heritage here in the United States and things like that. So. Anyway, after my, you know, the couple months that I spent there, I've always been kind of interested in it. And it was more interesting when I came here to Southport and I'd been here for several years. And it was in one of the historical society presentations that um, somebody mentioned the Estonian refugee boat. And I was like, wait, what? You know, what's that all about? So I started doing some research into it. And in fact, at one point, Bob Surridge asked me to do a presentation on it which I demurred, you did a far better job than I would have been able to research-wise. Um, but it's always interested me. And so, of course, when you published your article in the paper, I shared it with the Estonian Cultural Group, which I, I'm a member of on Facebook. And it just opened these floodgates of stories that I shared with you of people whose parents or grandparents had had a similar situation um, there were one woman, her family had come on one of the boats that had landed in Miami and she had stories to tell. And it's a very small community. They know or know of each other. But the, the, the interesting thing about the diaspora is every single Estonian American or Canadian, there's a big community around Toronto as well. They all have some version of the story, whether it was the actual movement from, um, you know, escape from Estonia, escape from Sweden to America at that time, or, you know, many of them spent four or five years in displaced person, displaced persons camps in Germany before they were sponsored to come to the U.S. and that. So they're a very proud community. You know, I'm not ethnically Estonian, but, you know, for 25 years, I've been an Estophile. So I think this presentation is great, and I'm glad that my little town has a little piece of that history. So... So thanks for putting this on. Thanks, Scott. And it really touched me that when Scott told me that he had shared the article that was in the state board pilot with the Facebook group, and then somebody on there knew the nephews of Captain Wortman living in Sweden. And so they were passing the article on to them. And so that made me happy that they would think, wow, they're, they're still talking about us in America. <laughs> So in little, in little Southport where they came and still being excited about the story. So that, that really touched me. Um, does anybody else have anything else that they want to um, ask or add or anything? Pat, you're on mute. You know, I always have something. <laughs> um, I was privileged to go to Estonia once for a half a day or so, uh, a port of call on a cruise ship. Uh, in the Scandinavian um, area, and it was lovely. Of course, we were at Tallinn, which is the um, the capital of Estonia, and uh, we happened to get there on a day when they were having a weekend festival, so it was quite um, exciting, a lot of fun um, to uh, see them dressed in native costumes and um, uh, eating um, uh, some of the food from way back as well as their current uh, food culture. But anyway, um, I, have, I have a special vase here in my uh, living room that's from Estonia that every time I dust it on rare occasions, <laughs> I think of Estonia. But um, also, uh, I know, of course, and you made reference to Lou Hardy's writing about um, becoming friends with August 
And um, as a result of being Lou's friends, I also became a quasi friend uh, to August and his wife and went with Lou out to supply out in the county to visit with them in their home a time or two. And um, it's been a while back now, and I, I don't remember exactly. I'm thinking Lou went to Estonia. Did you read that anywhere? I couldn't really tell in the writings. It, it, sometimes it appeared that he'd been there. Yes, I think he did go. Yeah, and I'm going to try to research that a little bit and get back to you on it. But uh, he, he took quite an interest in this story as well as August and his family who were here still here. And um, uh, I, I do believe that he did go to Estonia on one of his European trips and met, also met a couple of the family members there and maybe a niece or someone. But anyway, I'll check that out for you. But I was delighted to hear and be refreshed about the story again, because it's quite um, one of those special little things about Southport that you're not expecting, then boom, all of a sudden, <laughs> here we are with something else. Yeah. That's thank you very thing. much for the good work you did on it. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to the people that sent me information. Um, and it is an amazing thing about Southport. You know, you think of it as a small town and yet it just butts up against all these really interesting world events. Um, Mary Ellen, I don't know if you're there. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just wondered if you um, had anything or if you remembered your grandfather ever talking about it. Are you there? Yes. Oh. I had to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, uh, what's interesting is I, I had heard briefly about the Estonians, and I will tell you it was never talked about. Why? I don't know. I, I think we uh, people of that generation were a different group of people that, that had seen uh, the depression, the war, and it was just what you did is to help other people. Uh, I did not know that it was my grandfather that was out there when they came in until I read Tommy Harrelson's book. <laughs> my brother and I did not know that it was our grandfather. And uh, so never too old to learn something. <laughs> and thank you for what you did, Liz. Very interesting. It's, it's amazing too that you see uh, people who documented uh, our town and our history, like Art Newton, as well as uh, as Hugh Morton, because you will see old pictures that that they took. And of course, Hugh Morton is the gentleman who owned Grandfather's Mountain in North Carolina. So uh, quite interesting. And thank you so much. And everyone who contributed, it was a very interesting story. And uh, it's always uh, good to hear about our town. Thank right. you. Anything else? Hey Liz, uh, yes, Stephen Atkinson sent us a, sent us a link to, uh, to the Gerda three. Oh, okay. in Mystic, uh-huh. Connecticut. Wonderful. Steve, you wanna explain, explain that a little bit, a little bit more? Sure, yeah, I just think, um, it has an interesting, uh, it's slightly similar narrative. It, it was, um, it was a Danish, I think a Danish vessel. Um, it was actually uh, transporting uh, Jews out of Germany, but also made its way to Sweden, uh, from Denmark to Sweden. Um, so similar kind of World War II refugee uh, escape story. Um, but um yeah, I mean, just the, the whole construction, it's just such a very, very similar boat. And I think I might reach out to Mystic Seaport and see if they can give me some pictures of the, of the bilge <laughs> so I can compare it to, uh, to what we found on the waterfront and see if it's- The picture of the restored, I'm, I'm assuming that's a restored boat. Yes, yeah, yeah. They, uh, they've done extensive uh, yeah. restorations on it over well, the you, years. You can see the, uh, the, the role in that picture and and vice versa. Absolutely. Nice. Very nice. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, just again, as a reminder, on uh, September 1st, I hope you enjoy, uh, join us at the Southport Community Building, where we'll have um, 
you know, pictures and paintings and things um, to uh, of Art Newton's to share. And then on the second, the first Friday of September, he'll be the featured artist at the Ricky uh, Evans Gallery um, for the, the gallery walk. So we hope to see you all there. Okay.